I'm honored to be joined by a good friend, fellow Brooklyn resident, William Thompson, City Controller. Welcome to Citywide. Hi, Ken. How are you? So, how's business in New York? Business is good. Uh, things have gone well. I mean, if you look at the economy, it is humming. Uh, in, in, in many sectors. Uh, and if you look at the city's budget, uh, you know, you closed the books last year with a record surplus. It looks like this year we're onto a huge surplus also. So things are good right now. I don't think there's anybody who lived in New York um, in the aftermath of the terrible attack of 9-11 who isn't just astounded, uh, not that the city survived the attack, but that the economy has recovered to, to this extent. What do you attribute it to? Well, I, I think... As you looked, and, and right after September 11th, we had been in, in the throes of a recession, nationwide recession, the rest of the country had started to come out. I think we had started to just about come out, and then September 11th, and it kept us in a recession for at least another year and a half to two years. But I think one of the things, the decisions that were made after September 11th, when we started to grapple with difficult budget and record budget gaps, was not decimating city services. I think that's the biggest thing. If you look at the 1970s, when New York City almost went bankrupt, they laid off tens of thousands of people. They ruined, you know, city services and quality of life. I think that was the biggest difference this time around, that we didn't do that. We didn't ruin city services and destroy quality of life. So it put the city in a position to be able to rebound faster. Was there a missed opportunity, though, because at that time there was a lot of discussion about um, structural defects, structural imbalances, out-year gaps, and there may have also been a, a window to reform how city services were delivered that the city leadership, and perhaps appropriately, decided mm -hmm. not to take. I think at, at what you were looking at that point, was it a missed opportunity? Somewhat. But I think that what you wanted to do was to get the city back on its feet in so many ways. You didn't want to wind up with labor strife and problems uh, because uh, the city had gone through such a traumatic period and you wanted to make sure that the city stayed together and pulled together. So I think that everybody, if you look, that's one of the things that made New York City stronger. We all joined together after September 11th as a city. The unions were all part of it. And I think the decisions that were made not to try and upset that apple cart probably made sense. Uh, for that period of time, because you needed to rebound and rebound faster. Your office recently completed a, a study um, talking about urban centers around the, uh, the country. What, what did you find, and how does New York fit into that? Uh, well, pattern? you were looking at you know, residential growth and, and, and construction and development. New York City is probably leading the way, but if you look at urban centers around the country, there is a lot of residential construction in other urban centers. Chicago, Los Angeles, and others are growing and you know I think it's it's a you know if you look there was a period of time where urban centers in big cities declined uh, there there's kind of a rebirth out there right now for major urban centers so what kind of jobs are being created in New York all kind of jobs I mean the, the one thing that we had found is we looked back to 1997 and looked forward up to about 2004 uh, the thing that you saw probably the biggest growth which is a change we always look at payroll jobs and that's always been a measure. What you are seeing now is a huge growth in the number of self-employed individuals in New York City. That growth has outpaced, uh, you know, payroll jobs. If you look, you've had since 97 to about 2004, over 200,000 new self-employed individuals. And that is, you know, runs the gamut from attorneys uh, to healthcare workers to people who work in media and others. So that's been where New York City has had its biggest growth, self-employed individuals. It's interesting. We had uh, John Bowers from the Center for the Urban Future on the show mm -hmm. uh, uh, recently, and um, they had some uh, data from the 1990 to 2000 census, which indicated that there had actually been a, a decline in self-employed people. This, this is very much of a, of a turnaround. But I also, I wonder if um, which is cause and which is effect. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you have a, the sort of the traditional large corporation model, um, they order you where to be. Right. Um, and whether it's a desirable location or not, uh, when the CEO decides to move the, the, to Stanford, then the whole mm -hmm. organization goes there. Where you have these sort of flattened uh, organizations, people out there, networks, they can choose to live anywhere they want. Exactly. And if they can't get the services that they need, they don't want to be there. No, I, I would agree. I think that that is part of looking at it is people making different decisions. It is also 
people deciding, no, I don't want to be uh, in that big business. Uh, if you also look, businesses are outsourcing things more. Uh, there is also, you know, hiring, you know, uh, a freelance individual to do work where you would have employed them before, put them on the payroll, and, and you know, one of the concerns is health benefits now. You know, a lot of the corporations don't have to pay health benefits. So you're seeing a bit of a change in attitude and uh, as, as well on the corporate side, but also, as you point out, on the individual side, making different decisions, taking more control of their own lives and being able to go a little more mobile where, and going where the, the, you know, they feel comfortable, where the city services and quality of life fits for them. So you are seeing that kind of change. There was a... Uh, a point in time when, when New York's competition was was its suburbs, uh, then it was the Sun Belt. Now our competition seems to be London and Singapore and, and other major world trade centers. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about New York City's competitive position in the in the world capital markets? Well, we still, you know, New York City can still be looked at as the financial capital of the world. There is greater competition, though. There's greater competition in the Far East. There's definitely greater competition in London. I think a lot of what has concerned people, and it, there's, there have been a few things that have changed a little of that. Number one, after September 11th, most of your investment banking firms, your major you know, financial institutions, made sure that there's a part of their business that isn't in the same place. So they decentralized a little bit more. It might be, you know, in New Jersey, it may be in Connecticut, it may be in Westchester. They've spread that out just a little bit more. Things like Sarbanes-Oxley Bill, uh, that, that really, you know, for, for institutional investors like me, I mean, I oversee, you know, New York City's pension funds. Well, we were glad to see Sarbanes-Oxley come into play after, you know, people lost hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in, in corporate uh, chicanery. Uh, in you know in the early in you know the early part of this decade, but what you're starting to see now is IPOs that would have been done either in New York or the United States, really, but it would have been done in New York. Now they're in London. Now they're in other places. It, it is part of more of a global economy, uh, and that's one of the realities. Uh, at the same point, New York, in maintaining its position, you know, it continues to be things like quality of life, um, competitive nature. It still is the synergies between institutions that are in New York City. And no, you're going to have to look. I think there's been a lot of you know, discussion about modifying Sarbanes-Oxley so that smaller corporations and new IPOs will come back to the United States again. Uh, but in the end, it, it's, it's going to revolve around making some subtle changes in legislation, but also in keeping the quality of life and you know, New York City as a city with a low crime rate. Uh, I mean, all of that's quality of life, as well as looking at where our education system will be. The global economy has had a, another uh, significant impact on New York City, and that's the um, extraordinary amount of uh, immigration, 40% uh, of the city foreign-born, many of them entrepreneurs, some educated, but many are just uh, coming to New York for the same reason my grandparents did for, right. for a better uh, um, and my grandparents. Opp uh, opportunity. What are the... Um, entry level jobs, and what are some of the barriers to um, starting a small business in New York? Where, if, if you come off the plane, English is a second language. You've got a network of friends or relatives, perhaps, uh, but that's all that you're you're bringing, other than uh, a drive and ambition. How do you get started in New York? Where do you go? Well, a lot of it is, you know, it, it is working. I mean, if you see most of the the, the kind of the model. Uh, it is either friends or family who have helped to put together money for that small entrepreneur. It is working for three, four, five, six years, saving as much money as you can, and then starting a small business and growing that small business. We've got to do better in, as a city in things like small business loans and the supports we provide. We must have to do better in things like micro loans. I think you know that it's if, if you look at micro loans, and I've looked at a few programs that have been. What is that? How does that work? Small loans, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. The loans that you you know you go to a bank and they say, "Geez, that's that's too small." Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's more it's more of a problem in processing that than it is in kind of coming up with that loan. But micro loans are doing things like, you know, the small person who used to work, who's working at home, uh, who's doing you know working and sewing perhaps. Well, if that small homemaker can have a $5,000 loan, she can expand and do other things and, and, and enter other markets. I think we need to do more in areas like micro loans, small business loans to help those loans, I mean, to help those businesses expand, as well as counseling and support for those small or individual businesses. But you are right. It is immigrant growth 
uh, and, and immigration, the waves of immigration that have helped revitalize New York City. If you look around the city in Queens and the Bronx, almost no matter what borough you go to, the waves of immigration have helped to revitalize those communities. One of the initiatives that your office had was to expand banking services in, in underserved neighborhoods. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, banking development districts. What we have been able to do is using a legislation that had been passed by the state, but never really utilized in New York City. Bank deposits that used to sit in, say, a J.P. Morgan Chase or uh, or Citibank that would bring interest for the city. What we've done is we've taken those deposits, at least a portion of those deposits, and said to other banks, if you open bank branches in underserved, underbanked communities, we'll put $10 million, $15 million on deposit at below market rates. It allows banks to make money. It only takes somewhere between 20 and $30 million on deposit to make a bank branch profitable we help them along the way. And what it does in return, what you say to those banks is mortgages for the community as well as small business loans. And it's been a successful trade-off. What we've seen now is we have over $120 million in deposits in bank branches like Carver and Commerce, uh, Banco Popular, and others around the city of New York in neighborhoods that don't have bank branches. Citywide will continue right after this. Mrs. Johnson, good to see you again. This is Mike. You can trust him. He looks just like you. I'll be sucking up to you in order to make you sign the loan. So, here are your low monthly payments and interest rate, as we promised. Here's where they triple. The rest of this is really just here so that we get your house when you can't pay us back. Such a lovely house. Predatory lenders are never this easy to spot. Call us and protect yourself with the facts. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with the New York City controller, William Thompson. We were talking uh, before the break about uh, expanded banking services in New York. I want to ask about the flip side of that, and that is the amount of debt that people are taking on, um, particularly home mortgages that they may not be able to afford or understand, or uh, credit card debt. Um, you're the city's chief financial officer. What kind of financial advice do you, do you give to, to working class people who are struggling to pay their bills and are bombarded with the amount of credit that's available to them? Well, obviously, you know, manage your credit and, and don't uh, assume additional credit that you can't, uh, that you can't handle. Uh, the one, you know, in addition, and then there are credit counseling services out there. A lot of them that are nonprofit, go seek help. I mean, what we're seeing these days, uh, after you had record mortgage, you know, the interest rates were so low, uh, and, and and owning a home is part of the American dream. You've seen an increase in home ownership, but what you're starting to see now, as interest rates go up, as people in the subprime, and it's been talked about so much, the subprime market, what you're starting to see is an increase in foreclosures. The number of foreclosures in New York City these days is double what it was two years ago. So we're, we're starting to show you know, major concern about that. Uh, we've just put in place kind of a you know, foreclosure you know, hotline or helpline, really. I mean, you know, the control is mortgage foreclosure helpline. If people are in trouble, they should pick the phone up and reach out to us. There are, you know, counselors on the other side, people, caseworkers who can work with them, put together their package and see, the, you know, the work, the problems that they're having, and then refer it over to one of our nonprofit partners who have been approved by HUD and, you know, work with people to try and save their home. So it is very important these days. We're seeing a lot of problems uh, as interest rates continue to creep up. I want to offer a, another uh, possible contributing factor to mm -hmm. the increase in foreclosures in New York. And that is that we have a, 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 a convoluted, complicated um, property tax system. Uh, one of the provisions that's supposed to benefit um, homeowners is that uh, in a single family house, your um, property taxes can't go up more than, your assessment can't go up more than a certain amount every year, five or six percent. Mm -hmm. But because of the dramatic increase in property values, Virtually every single family house in the city is underassessed compared to, to market value. And the practical consequence of that is that even if the property tax rate stays flat, your property tax bill, your property tax bill because is a home of the owner, assessments. because the assessment is going to go up 6% every year forever, which means that over, what, 11 or 12 years, your property taxes right. are going to double, and then they're going to double, and they're going to double. If you're a fixed income, income worker, or retired person, how can you possibly keep up with that? Well, that's, that's where we've seen problems. I mean, at one point, we had come out with a proposal for seniors 
that you know we called the cash program it was you know city assistance for senior homeowners to try and get an additional rebate the mayor does a four hundred dollar rebate right now for homeowners to try and create an additional rebate up to six hundred dollars for seniors over sixty five or i believe over sixty one um, and and tie that to the star program the state star program the enhanced star program because you realize that there are on fixed incomes their assessments continue to go up but for seniors and and that's the one thing that you always say whether it is going out and talking to an attorney or go to the bank go to a reputable bank and have conversations about things like reverse mortgages and others things that can help protect seniors so they won't lose their homes uh, i mean there are a lot of there's a lot of support out there to try and make sure we keep people in their homes that they don't lose that valuable asset that they have we need to you know people need to take advantage of those things i want to shift gears for a second you um, alluded earlier to the fact that you are the city's chief investment officer mm -hmm. uh, not the sole trustee of Correct. the pension funds but <laughs> you have an awful lot to say about an awful lot of, uh, of money um, maybe you can tell first of all the retirees that are watching the show how you doing in the market uh, but i also want you to talk a little bit about how you see your role as a public custodian of, uh, of dollars when it comes to social responsibility? Okay. Number one for the retirees, the pension funds are doing well. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, we're, we are uh, looking and, and, and doing some different things than were done before. We are, you know, we've invested in real estate these days along with, you know, the trustees on our five pension boards. They are looking at, you know, we've, we've moved our allocation and now we're trying to put 5% in real estate. 5% in private equity, Treasury's protected securities. We're looking at some other things as other public pension funds do, like, you know, like hedge funds and others in small, in small ways. What we're doing is, you know, so we're not just tied to the market. You know, when things go up, when the market goes up, we make a lot of money. When the market goes down, though, we lose money. We're trying to kind of narrow that range of volatility, and we are doing well in that regard. So for, you know, pension, uh, for the members of our pension funds, things are very good these days, very, very good. Uh, but as far as, as trying to, you know, be an activist investor, I think New York City is probably the most aggressive public pension funds. The trustees on my board, along with, you know, myself, we are very aggressive in doing things to, I believe, return shareholder value to make sure that and some would say are you social investing and the answer is no we think we're protecting the bottom line and the long-term interests of companies at times when the companies don't want to so things like employment protection for gays and lesbians and individuals of transgender experience but you know looking at making sure that corporate CEOs advisory votes on executive compensation Last, or, you know, th this, this week I was in Washington and testified uh, in front of a Senate subcommittee on companies like Halliburton and, and those who are doing business through loopholes, offshore subsidiaries in nations that support terrorism like Iran and Syria and trying to make sure we close that loophole. Uh, everything from looking at them and talking about sustainable business models, making sure that they take care, better care of the communities that they're in and the environment that they're in. All of this in the end, we think it works to a better, stronger bottom line in the long run for the members of our pension fund, for the shares of stock that we hold. So, you know, it is, some would say, are you social investing? And the answer is, no, we think we're being smart long-term investors. long-term asset of the city of New York are young people. Uh, you're a former president of the Board of Education. Are we preparing our young people for the jobs of the future, and are we running the Department of Education in a business-like fashion? Oh, this is, it almost goes back. Uh, I was at a, a conference uh, a couple of months ago, and it talked about at least the fiscal situation and the Department of Education. And my comment was, you know, they're about to embark on their third reorganization in five years. And I said it was an investment that we were looking to make. Uh, and a company had done that. We would probably term it a high-risk investment. I think it is still, the jury is still out on, you know, on the job that's being done uh, in Tweed these days, you know, by the Department of Education and the Chancellor. I think that if you look you know, the graduation rate is creeping up, and they, you know, I give them credit for that. But I'm not sure that, you know, if you look at No Child Left Behind coupled with, you know, continued testing and testing and testing and testing, I don't know that we're just not preparing students to take tests. 
as opposed to increasing their knowledge base. I'm just not sure right now. So, you know, I've tried to, I, you know, I, I applaud the chancellor for some of the innovative things he's tried. Uh, at the same point, I'm just not sure that in the long run this system will be, you know, the promise of mayoral control, and I still support mayoral control. I'm not sure it's going to be realized right away. Talking about mayoral control for a second. <laughs> yes. Um, Mayor Bloomberg um, is perhaps the uber businessman. Uh, he's a self-made billionaire, um, billionaire, uh, multi-billionaire, and uh, uh, you know had a remarkable uh, entrepreneurial career, and has brought, I think, a lot of um, his management skills to uh, to mm -hmm. City Hall. Um, people are looking down the road because of term limits. We know that he won't be here after 2009. Um, of the at least the Democrats who have publicly um, been quoted as having some interest in, uh, in succeeding him, mm -hmm. I couldn't help but notice that you're the only one who seems to have had a private sector job. Um, and I was wondering mm -hmm. whether you thought that being a businessman was a critical qualification to be mayor of the city of New York and what you think the business community is going to be looking for in the next mayor. I think the business, I, I don't know that and probably don't believe that, that having a business background uh, is a necessity in being a good mayor. I think we've had other mayors who haven't had the business background who have done excellent jobs. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd go and point at uh, perhaps Ed Koch just as one example. Uh, I mean, there are others who have done well, but Ed, because he took over when the city was in a fiscal hole, if you will, and help to bring the city back through a, a combination of different things. So I don't think you have to have, you know, that business background to be a good mayor. It's a question of leadership. It's a question of vision. It's a question of what do you believe in and, and, and are willing to push. The business community, I think, is looking at, you know, is, is looking at the job that Mike Bloomberg did. And, you know, it's not just a question of business skills. Mike's one of them. And I think the business community embraced Mike, even when the city perhaps did not. Uh, back, you know, in his first two, two and a half years. Uh, and, and now that the city and, and everything is going well, the city has, you know, rallied and, and, and likes the management style of the mayor. I don't know that I think the business community is going to be looking at the next person. As, what do they believe in? What is it? And how focused are they on making sure that business stays and grows in New York City? It's a question of what are you thinking about taxes and or perhaps tax cuts or at least stability in the area of taxes? quality of life, keeping crime low. Those are the things that are going to keep business here. And if that changes, it will run business out. So I don't think that there is, you know, I don't think the business community is saying, geez, we need a business person. I think they're saying we need somebody who is going to be able to run New York City and run it well. My thanks to New York City Controller William Thompson. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us.